Welcome to the Enlighten Up podcast. I'm Lisa Watson and will be joined by my co-hosts Nicole Frolic and Brian Koenigberg. The Enlighten Up podcast is a weekly show that provides an unconventional and refreshing spin on spirituality, where three friends and weekly guests share informative, fun, and usually off-the-wall conversations. Unlike others, we provide fringe and skeptical viewpoints on all topics, because our experience has taught us that the echo chamber is a boring place from which to learn. So regardless of where you are in your spiritual journey, we can promise you, you're going to find a place to fit in here. So we invite you to grab a drink and listen in on our casual, entertaining, and hopefully enlightening conversation. And Enlighten Up is a self-funded podcast. So if you would like to help us to continue to be able to produce, enhance, and expand the show for our audience, then please send your support using the link in the show notes or go to our website, lightenup.us, and check out our merchandise shop where you can purchase merchandise that will allow you to express some spiritual humor. You may also show your support by leaving us a review on iTunes and following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Thank you all so much for listening and supporting us. And now let's jump right into the episode. Welcome back to Enlighten Up, everyone. I am very happy to be doing this episode with you because it happens to be our two-year anniversary, and I'm here with Lisa and Brian, and we've been so honored to be graced by one of our originals, our OGs. Michael Ronane is back on the show with us for our two-year anniversary. Michael, honored. how the hell are you doing? I'm, I'm just honored to be with you guys as well. <laughs> I know you're so honored. As you as he's laughing I know. <laughs> not believable <laughs> i don't know what you're talking about we had to drag him on kicking and screaming no i was looking forward to this it's been a it's no. been a year plus so well you got nice you, to... you got the drunk invite from lisa and i <laughs> is that what it was all right to the listening audience the only reason i'm here is because somebody couldn't control their alcohol <laughs> You get you get drunk called that night too. Yeah, <laughs> we had fun on the island. Yeah, we I'm did. Go through some of these texts. There's some uh, interesting pictures. We, you don't you don't need to go through we the decided, text. <laughs> <laughs> we decided our phones needed drunk locks on I, them. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, how's your, pro- how's your, just out of curiosity, Nicole? Because you come go to Colorado to the islands. Has your skin changed? I'm just being a skin it's, nerd for a second. Oh my gosh, my skin looks so much better. I was looking at the pictures, and like it, it takes years off of you. I oh my god, it's like Lisa and I were talking about that. Lisa came home looking like a different person. She she left Colorado white, like me, <laughs> and she came and she came back like a different ethnicity yeah. and she is so dark after nine days in the island sun it i saw some friends last night and they said the same thing they were like what happened well, what's look the, like point, a of, what's the point of going to a caribbean island if you don't look like you came from a caribbean island when you get back well you some know. people don't get that dark i get i get really dark and then i come back and they're like oh you're back uh home okay let's lose your tan in 28 hours yeah right. <laughs> yeah. Well, going down in the sun, did it? Well, I mean, not not that you guys you guys see a lot of sun in Colorado. No, okay. Well, oh, this yeah. is the thing. I, I like Lisa came down thinking, oh well, I'm used to the Colorado sun because is, you're. Is it different, Lisa? It's like, oh, you, you you come down going, oh man, I can be out in the sun for four or five hours in Denver, and then like four or five minutes in the islands, you're like pretty much lobsterized. Yeah, I was torched. <laughs> <laughs> the first day we yeah i was like wow yeah. that was that felt a lot different learn than, you learn not to her. mess with the sun i mean i never actually i, I remember never yeah. using spf products until i moved to florida and even then it took me about a good half a year to like okay maybe i should buy some i we, i did succumb to to spf one day we mm-hmm. lathered up on the day two even nicole joined me and because we had a trip to on a boat to Stingray Island, so we had to be in the sun, but we were like, oh, Stingray we City. Need to break today. Yeah, Stingray, Stingray City. City. <laughs> Not Stingray Island. It felt like, felt an, like island. an island. It felt like an island. It's like a big yeah, sandbar. Yeah, out in the middle of the ocean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I will never forget. I got. I used to get made fun of a lot by a few ex-Cayman friends of mine that 
because we were we went on the same uh, thing that you went on, with Stingray City, and then they take you snorkeling afterwards. Do they do that? We we did the snorkeling before yes, before or but... before. Okay, and so I get I, I almost I this is my probably the closest that I've come to knowing that I was going to die was <laughs> on the snorkeling trip. <laughs> Stop. No, like literally I was going through my final thoughts before uh, one of the boat guys threw me a life life oh. saver thing. Were you walking towards the tunnel? I I, I call I, I was I was you know confessing my sins. I was going through the whole like what, does I, who I did what, wrong. Sins, what like, sins did who you wrong? confess? I, 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 thankfully, I had I, I had the uh, lifesaver you know thrown to me in time because I think I was like on year six of my life. You went back to year six. Oh yeah, man. Uh, what you, hold what on a know? second. Wait, 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 wait. The thing that our audience needs to know and understand why this is so funny to Lisa and myself is because. <laughs> The water there is so salty, it's so buoyant that you actually don't need a life vest to float in the water. You just let your body go up to the surface this and is, you float. This is, this is often, often said <laughs> by females who have anywhere between 20 to 30% body fat ratio. That's right. That helps them float. And I sink like a rock. Are, I literally, are you saying no, that I, you I, had I, a very had, lean body at that fat. time? No, yeah, I, did you just call us fat? Are you body shaming us? <laughs> no, 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 no. That's just fact. Science. <laughs> he's, he's quoting math and science. Thank you, Brian, for backing up science for once <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> oh, God. No, um, I literally, well, I, I was a little cocky, too, because I, I, I swam a lot back when I almost drowned. Um, I swam a lot when I thought I was a good swimmer. So I grabbed the snorkel and I grabbed the, you know, the, the goggles and, and I'm like, ah, I don't, I don't need a life vest. Screw that. And I jump in. And the first thing I, I, I happens when I jump in from the catamaran is I lose the snorkel. So I just have my um, goggles on. And it was so choppy that day. It was very choppy and, and the current was going crazy. I'm like, ah. I drop my snorkel. I'm going to go swim around the boat, go up the little stairs, go get another snorkel and then jump back in. Well, there's a lot of like, you know, people in my way. So I decided to take the long route around the boat. And so I was on the quiet side of the boat where nobody was at. And I'm like going, oh, crap, I'm going to die. I can't get to the front of the boat. And there is like nobody near, nobody around. And you know how they have the, um, what do they call those, Nicole? The little buoy things that are on the side of the boat to prevent the boat mm -hmm. from being damaged when mm -hmm. it's a dock. Well, they had like a little, yeah, they had like a little hole in one of those. And I put my, my index finger in it and I'm going, I'm bobbing up and down in the ocean with this <laughs> cataract. The visual. With just, a, with just oh. an index finger saving my life. But my index <laughs> finger is growing weak. It's, what was wrong with your legs? My, my legs were useless at this point because I didn't bring my my flippers. Oh, you were saying <laughs> flippers? Yeah, that was my another mistake that I forgot to recant. Oh, uh, so, don't my finger strength need flippers. I didn't use flippers or a life vest when I went. I, I, I was a bit too cocky. That was all it was. I was a bit too cocky, and so I went. I saw the next buoy. The next buoy was like maybe twenty feet away. I'm like going. If I can swim there and stick my index finger into that hole, I can do it and then take a rest and then continue on. So this is almost so, like those monkey bars where you're trying to go across the absolutely, monkey. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But it was a survival. Like, like, you know, if you dropped, you're dead. So I was like, I swim and like halfway between the two buoys, I'm like, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. Literally, I'm going through my final thoughts. And then like, you know, one of those, um, gosh, the, uh, did you do red sail? One of the red sail. Captain uh, guys, Marvin. Yeah, one of the guys looked over the edge of uh, the catamaran and saw me struggling. And he's like, You need some help, man. <laughs> I'm like, No, I got no, this. No, I, I, well, this is the <laughs> sickest thing about my human boy brain. 
I was debating whether to say, no, I got this. A like literally you my, pride, my pride oh, no. that I had at that moment was enough, just almost enough to kill me. <laughs> and then I just like sheepishly looked up and go, I need help. <laughs> they threw the they threw the little tow ring in and they towed me into the boat and like people were looking at me and I was so embarrassed and just kind of sat in the corner and waited for us to go home hoping that I would never okay, see another so one of those two rings again. Since Brian usually asks this question, but I know you so well, we have to ask. Were there any drugs or alcohol in your system while this was happening? No. No. No, thank goodness. Actually, it was like maybe like 11 o'clock in the morning or something like that. So it was. What? Um, okay, that's never that stopped you. On the <laughs> I, well, I was I was with my sister, but she was she had, you know, the proper attire on, you know, like a life vest. And flippers. Oh, flippers. you were with family. That's why. And she was off, you know, flipping around. And, you know, I, I'm like, OK, I'll go snorkeling. I've been snorkeling a dozen times before. So it's like it's not a big deal to me. So I just jumped in thinking I'd just take a quick peek with no flippers and no life vest and then jump back on the boat. Well, you know, it was it was worse than I thought. <laughs> and water does scare me because this is the, the three near death experiences I've had. Two of them come from water. One of them comes from water and alcohol. So I try not to mess with alcohol too much when I'm in the water. Silence on that one. <laughs> I don't know. Wait, you guys haven't alcohol, had near death experiences? Is water. I, I know. I I don't. You guys have must have. You guys. Man. I gotta imagine out of the, the the out of four of us, and three of you, one of you guys have experienced something that goes, man. If it was just off by one second, or off by one inch, or Lisa, whatever. Lisa did when she was. Yeah, when when Lisa was in high school, she almost died in a car accident. But she. Did, I don't think you look at it as a near death experience. No, I don't. I was in a very bad car accident. We, um, the car was spinning around. Oh, we, yeah. and um, a tree was coming towards me, and I just remember the tree just barreling towards my face, and thinking, "Wow, if I don't get out of this car, I am gonna die." And I grabbed the door handle, and luckily I didn't have my seatbelt on. And at the moment I grabbed the door handle, the car hit the tree and it just allowed because the door then opened it allowed me to shoot out the door so I was thrown about 40 feet from the car but I wasn't killed if you if you were buckled in do you think you would have kicked it oh I would have I would have been dead that's the a car, pretty good de near uh, death experience I think that counts the dashboard of the well, of my seat the dashboard p pushed the passenger seat all the way into the back seat. There was no passenger seat. Oh wow! Yeah, no, that's a, yeah. that's that's legit. That's a, that's one where you're like you know if you didn't do one thing right, you'd be a goner. And that's what I'm talking about. Why, why don't you see that as a near death experience though? Um. Well, when I think of a near death experience, I think of someone who has actually died and come back. Yeah. Like that they've yeah. crossed over, not that they just. <clears throat> couldn't swim there, may, there needs to be another term <laughs> then for the term that we're describing but like that's... almost die like vi i don't know it was i've had a couple experiences like that we were near death it was an experience <laughs> well when we had john mathis on we talked about that remember when john mathis was on and he was talking about his near-death experience and how like people actually have like ratings of like well how how close to oh death i do were remember you? that yeah I remember yeah. that. It's a thing. And like, you don't feel like yours is a legitimate near death experience unless well, you. What, wasn't this the one that had the near death, but he actually wasn't dead. He was just in kind of like a coma or something. Yeah. He went to the cricket match up in somewhere else. Didn't he meet some celebrity? <laughs> yeah. While he was there? The, the, the comedian. Um, yeah. Can't remember his name. Anyway, he I had that whole remember. Harry Potter experience. So. Michael, how has your spiritual development been in the last year? Because it's been almost a year since you've been on. Yeah. Um, and, and almost a year later, my spiritual development has been nil, just the way <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I'm serious, though. It's like I, 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 um, I sleep better. I am more happy, relaxed, 
no entities bothering you anymore? Huh? I don't have me nasty dreams waiting for me. I don't have any kind of like um, night sweats and um, uh, sleep paralysis. I've even been, you know, I haven't had to deal with any of that stuff. Um, and you attribute this to I attribute this to a couple of things. I, well, your spiritual no, I literally was thinking about this about a month and a half ago. Is like, man, I'm, I'm I'm doing well. I'm happy. I'm in a happier place. And you know, I I, I don't necessarily miss thinking about beyond this 3D realm, according to you guys. This 3D realm that I'm living in, because. When I do that, that's when bad stuff starts to happen. <laughs> You're in that ignorance is bliss place. Well, I mean, what what what's the point? I mean, like, I, <laughs> but I also think, I mean, I I'm not sure if I really believe that it was a spiritual something rather happening to me. I really think our human brains are so extremely strong at making crap up, and the reason why I say that is because. Um, I, I read I read a, a couple of different articles, but one of the articles that I read that I found fascinating, and and I, I saw a few more articles to kind of back it up. And I mean, it's a it's a hypothesis of a, of all things. But we have a when we think about something, we dwell on something with our minds. Our in uh, we we I guess create something called like a dream intent, and that dream intent is something that we bring into our sleep. And we will start dreaming about, you know, whatever we're, our minds were obsessed with during the day. And so if you're always talking about demons and, and angels and, and uh, parasites, spiritual parasites, and just things like that, that uh, envelop your mind, and then you go to bed with that just fresh in your mind, yeah, you could probably have some crazy whacked out dreams that I would imagine you would consider the next day like some sort of spiritual messaging going on or some sort of demonic attack going on. And mm -hmm. and I really feel Makes like sense. this is probably what I experienced a bit when I was uh, going through like the uh, constantly thinking about what's beyond our 3D realm. And it just really just makes me feel like, okay, well, why do I want to? dwell on that it's like when i went through my my divorce years ago and unfortunately it was an obsession of mine constantly thinking about that relationship and whatnot guess what i dreamed about which wasn't dreams whenever i dreamed about it, it became nightmares and that's because it was constantly on my mind so it's like what what would be the difference if i was thinking about spirituality and and demons and angels and all that stuff all the time of course, I'm going to have more dreams, more things that are going to make me feel like, oh, there's something there. And then ever, since I, ever since I let that stuff go, I've been having normal, interesting dreams, but normal, kind of like boring for, the, for this type of podcast, but, you know, whatever. And then okay. life kind of Wait, just goes though. by. Before you were on this podcast, you <clears throat> had the sleep paralysis, though. Yes. You said you had been having that for years. Yes. But, so I don't think you can blame it on talking about spirituality with us. Well, I blame sleep paralysis on the physicality of what sleep paralysis is, which is basically your mind, your your uh, mind wakes up before your body does. And there is something. I, I, I okay, you you raise a good point. I have had a few episodes of sleep paralysis in the past year, but I'm so conditioned and used to it that it doesn't bug me anymore. Like there is something psychologically crazy about sleep paralysis that everybody who goes through it feels and they feel like there's some sort of dark entity or something in the room and there's just there must be something that we have in our half dream state while we're kind of our mind is awake but our body's asleep where we just have that overwhelming feeling like there's something in the room with us because it's not just obviously me and it's not just a person who dwells on spirituality but anybody who goes through just the physicality of sleep paralysis usually it has some sort of encounter like that so I, it's like i can't really chalk that up to um spirituality as well if that makes sense yeah absolutely 
And, and of course, we. What, that's why they say don't well, – that's why I will not watch a scary movie or anything of that nature that scares me right before I go to bed because I know that's the last thing imprinted in my mind. It will probably contribute to dreams I won't want to dream again. Mm-hmm. I'm the same way. Uh, I have – I only, won't even watch a scary movie commercial. Mm-hmm. He won't. When we watched <clears> – we've watched that Narco series and I was having – disturbing dreams like i decided i didn't want to watch that before i went to bed anymore it's gonna have just because of all the murder and just pablo escobar and, running after you yeah it was having <laughs> like killing and kidnapping and just crazy dreams i was like yeah I, I can't watch this stuff i don't know i i think i look at tv maybe it's because i've just been you know grew up with tv and and things like that i just i always looked at it as like haha it's fake like whenever mm-hmm. i watched like like those I never, I don't watch them because I just, it's not my genre that I'm interested in. But like, you know, if you saw one of those movies like Saw or something like that, where it's just overly gratuitous, um, grotesque mayhem when, it, yeah, mayhem when it comes to bodies and things like that, it just doesn't bother me because I look at it as just like, like claymation fake or whatever. I don't know. It's just, it just seems so fake. Now, when I go by what bugs me more in real life is like when I go by a I drive a lot in my life. And so when I go by an accident where clearly someone died, they got the yellow tarp over the area, that bugs me a heck of a lot more than any kind of gory, grotesque movie. Right, because it's real. Because it's real. And it's like one of those things that I actually think about for like four or five days, like, who is that person? That could have been me. You know, all those kind of things. Instead of like a a movie with some guy in a hockey mask running after you doesn't really creep me out. But I think it's too. Brian strong. always, Brian always says that to me because it's not real. But yet he can't even watch a commercial for a scary movie, so it doesn't make any sense the, to me. The, the the kind of scary movies that bother me are the the end of the dark hallway and something is moving and you don't know what's down there. Because when I was a when I was a kid, I used to every every night before I went to bed, like I had to go to bed you know, a little bit earlier, but so my mom would already be in bed. My dad, we were all like sitting down watching TV and I had to go to bed earlier than my brother. Cause he was older than me. And so I'd, I'd go to the, to the bottom of the stairs and I'd look up to the top of the stairs and you know, the top of the stairs is a dark hallway and I wasn't allowed to turn the light on cause mom was sleeping. So I couldn't turn the up the hall light on and I had such an active imagination. I would see, you know, something at the end of the dark hallway at the top of the stairs and I would create, you know, I would create this, you know, imagery and I would like, it was so, you know, believable to me. And that's like, still, it's like, I don't want to like, remember that yeah i mean still as an adult you know like when you're when you're when you're gone it's like okay make sure I turn all the lights on and the, <laughs> i didn't know the, this story the house is blazing full of light just because you know the night is dark and full of terrors <laughs> <laughs> and, and i am not afraid of the dark or scary movies i'm not I afraid of the dark been. at all but it's the end of the dark hallway the only scary. reason i'm afraid of the dark the only reason is because i'm afraid i'm gonna stub my toe other than that i couldn't care less yeah, there's that. <laughs> but did you guys go through like oh the Blair goodness. Witch Blair Witch uh, movie? Do you remember seeing that? Long I never ago? watched it. Well, I was sick I was, to yeah, my stomach when I left. That. I was, it was well, def- I was in college, and there was they, they at college. A lot of times they do like these pre pre um, releases on uh, movies to kind of get people talking about it back then before the it was before really internet kind of settled in. Um, and so they, there was this, uh, I was even at the university of Washington and they go, Oh yeah, we're gonna go watch the Blair watch Blair witch project. I guess it was some project that some college guys did over in Maryland. I'm like, okay, I'll go with you. Wow. When you actually go into that movie thinking it's a real documentary. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. It messes your brain up big time. That's what I, I thought. Know. That see, so it wasn't that a real me, documentary. Well, it wasn't. No, it was. <laughs> it was like the first of its genre to be filmed. You know, like with a hand cam, and it was made to look real. You know, like they like they do the TV shows now, the 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 docu series. Yeah, well, like they like the, you know anything with a shaky camera makes you feel like it's real footage, and that's what they 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 did that well. 
And um, they they did that without telling me it was not real. <laughs> and, so, and we didn't, like I said, we didn't have a smartphone to go check really quick afterwards. So I'm walking around in a just a frightened state after that movie for at least a good day before I uh, I was convinced by other people that it wasn't real. <laughs> I was so scared when I left that theater because I was convinced it was real as well. Yeah. That me and my spiritualness looked at my boyfriend who I had gone to the movie with and I said, I need to eat as much garlic as possible. Now we need to go get a Caesar salad. I need to eat a Caesar salad and eat as much garlic as possible to make sure nothing comes towards me in the middle of the night. Literally, you were thinking that? I No, I did it. I thought it and I went and did it. <laughs> wow. I was so scared. I was so nauseous from watching that because of the way the camera, like I got nauseous in my stomach as well as being so scared. Mm-hmm. I mean, at least like from motion seen... sickness or just anxiety. Mo- both. Yeah, it was a good movie though. When you think about what it did to me, and 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 just the, I, I mean, I you can't watch the movie now. It looks terrible when you watch the movie now. But like back back then, it was kind of like a. I'm kind of glad I went in with that open mind of thinking it was actually real for like for 24 hours. You got the authentic experience. <laughs> Well, because well, I I think this ties around to what we're talking about a little bit because I just looked at movies completely as fake after that. Like, oh, okay, it's not a big deal, and like I like force myself to think uh, whenever I started watching a scary movie, like, okay, it's just a movie, it's just a movie, not a big deal. Kind of like um what I did with Thunder when I was a when I was a kid versus Thunder versus an adult when I was when you know the, I'm not sure if I ever shared this with you guys, but the only reason I got into weather was because thunder scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. Hmm. And and when I asked really? them, and this is in the in the Pacific Northwest, you get a thunderstorm like once a year. So it wasn't like a, a daily occurrence to get used to. So when it when it hit, it was like, whoa. It, I mean, it was like such an impactful noise that you really thought something supernatural was happening. And of course, when I go to my loving mother and father they just told me it was god moving furniture which does not help the fear factor like oh i remember that one. yeah and so like i was told that yeah literally or or that the angels were bowling yeah yeah something kind of like ridiculous which that is just the that is just absurd my my daughter asked me what thunder was and it's like you know and it's lightning and it's heating up and you know, it's like and it this is what it is yeah. i mean that, yes. that see that's a beautiful story for my little boy brain back then but instead my lo- little boy brain with the imagination thrown into it along with mom and dad trying to make sure that i believe into in in, a, in some spiritual religious reasoning uh, got freaked out by god moving furniture up there and it just didn't make sense to me. So obviously, uh, why, why is God moving? Yeah. Is he leaving us? There's, there's so many questions that spawn from just that. Does he need furniture? Does he have bugs in his there apartment? There really is a heaven up in the Can clouds. Can he not pay his rent? There's so many other questions that come from that. You're right, <laughs> but it did not explain this fearful noise that was happening in the sky. And so, 20 years later, I started studying, or less than that. So you know, like, it, it it reminds me of of when my daughter was young and, and storms would come and she was never, she, she, the lightning or thunder didn't bother her. It was the wind. She hated like any time, like a breeze would come. She thought that meant, you know, it was going to be some sort of storm. Yeah. Wind just, howling, just little, wind, little wind howling day. can be really trippy too, but, but not necessarily, you know, wind howling, just a breezy day and she starts to get, you know, mad and anxious at the weather. It's like, no, I don't want a storm. <laughs> Maybe she died in a past life in a windstorm. Yeah. Past oh, life. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's an easy out. Easy out. Well, why are people, why do people have such great fears of like flying in an airplane or Fears of water, yeah, things that are unexplainable. Fears of not having flippers. Well, I, I mean, the, I feel like they're explainable. Fear of flying to me is a lack of control. Like you, everybody knows, statistically, you'll you'll have a better chance of kicking the bucket driving in your own neighborhood than in a plane. Uh, yet it's the lack of control that people usually are freaked out about. 
And obviously, if you get an accident in an airplane, eh, chances are you're going to die. And then you got the fear of water, in my opinion, because you can't breathe. <laughs> that would be a good fear. I don't know. I feel like everything, not irrational fears. Th those are the ones like where I'd be interested to study like psychologically. Like, oh, I, I fear, you know, anything that's green. You know, those things are a little bit different. I think that's more of a brain problem. <laughs> Well, segueing out of brain problems, going out of the mind and going into the heart, do you believe, you know, when you were on our uh, podcast, you had some issues with love, but that might be resolved right now? No, no, not at all, actually. Um, I really just have a new look at love. Oh, do tell. I, 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 dropped the, I, dro I, I dropped the old adage of what people ex have... have uh, indoctrinated me over the years of what love is supposed to be love is supposed to be like and, and all this stuff and i just look at love as like if you got two people that are compatible get along happy and like each other that's love to me if you got two people that um are physically attracted to each other but you know don't really care about hanging out with each other too much to me that's just that's a that's something different and so I've, and you didn't learn this in high school. You just figured this out last year. No, it wasn't that. It was high. First of all, nobody. There's a lot of people that don't even learn this throughout their entire life, and and you don't learn this in an all boys high school. I'm sorry, Brian. So you have to. <laughs> I I don't I don't remember you going to an all boys high school. So you learned it. You learned a different different kind of special kind of love. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Good old fashioned boy school. Boy school. <laughs> um, no, you, you, I, I just look at it as, I, I don't know, my frame has been completely changed. Like, I, I couldn't care. I look at it as her as a, another human being in this world, just like me. And we get along with each other as we're going through life. And that's fine. Do, do you have a I don't look special at like, someone you're talking I, about right now? Yeah, I, I, I've, I've had a girlfriend for a nice. year, probably... I guess we're in 13 months now. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're, we're just fine. I, I enjoy spending time with her. But, like, I'm not going to sit there and go, oh, man, you know, we had huge nervous butterflies and all that stuff. It was kind of like it just happened. It was like we went out. It wasn't like I felt like that overly um, interest in a relationship or in the word love. Like it just didn't mean too much to me anymore because love is was just a, a joke for most of the time and still is in, in most people's terms in my opinion. So yeah, nothing's changed. So not much has, not changed, much has changed then. <laughs> <laughs> but you're just happy in a relationship. Up. Yeah. See there you go. I mean you yeah, look at it that way. Yeah, sure. I'm happy. That's a big change. That is a big change. But I'm not gonna sit there and go, oh, Love. Love has everything. First, I found a way to love myself, and now I can love her. No. I didn't ask yeah. that. Why are you projecting that onto it? No, you know, <laughs> no, but I'm not saying you did it, but like whenever people go, oh, well, you gotta take time and love yourself. Then you can find out what love is. Like, shut the frig up. <laughs> that crap. Keeping it real. Keeping it real. Everybody, everybody, everybody just dishing out great advice when they're in a relationship and they're happy. Oh, you gotta love yourself. That's, by the way, Nicole. I know you know this, and you probably do. Uh, the rest of you guys probably do too. I hate it when people say you gotta love yourself first. Have you heard, have you heard that a lot? Yes. Because I also heard it a lot from. Uh, oh gosh, my goodness, I can't remember her name, Nicole. Your guys is old pal. We talked, we've talked about it many times on the show when you were on that too. But like, okay. uh, what was her name? Ah, oh, the, 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 a friend, your guys old friend, um, who may not be friends with you. I don't want to, you know, who I'm oh, talking about. from Florida. No, from Denver. Oh, Stephanie. Stephanie. Yes. I don't know. I, uh, so, so I remember hearing that a lot from her when I went a long time ago, when I was hanging out with you guys over there and I was like, uh, in the back of my mind, I was like, I want, just be quiet. I don't want to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, there are times where people learn love in relationships and there are times where people learn love when they're just in relationship with themselves. So 
everything's different for everyone. Yeah, I, I, I guess. I guess. I mean, I don't know. I think love, the, the definition is way too broad. And people just kind of... That is a very general, descri- you know, to say love yourself. It yeah. doesn't really say it doesn't really, much. No. It, it, no, to me, you know what it was? Much. Like when I was going through like some serious, severe depression, and it'd be the equivalent of someone going, I just... Just snap out of it. Come on, just just smile and be happy. You'll yeah, be yeah, that's true. Or it's like if you've never driven a car before, and someone's like, "Well, just go drive the car." It's like, um, <laughs> you know, there's if you don't really, oh. yeah, if you don't really know, if we're not taught this stuff, and well, and we're not really given great examples and role well, first models. You gotta drive yourself, and then you'll be able to drive that car. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, how how many of us had? parents giving us a great example of relationship and communication. And I mean, I, I, I would guess that more people get it wrong than right. I would say, I would, I would agree with you. I would say about 80%, 90% get it wrong. Okay. So if, if, if that's what we're talking about, that's pretty much all of us are not seeing a good, stable, communicative relationship it's full of love and trust and honor and all those things, right? So if that's not what we're seeing, no wonder it's a struggle for most people. Yeah. Well, I also think that it, things evolve. I mean, I look at my parents; they've been they're celebrating their fiftieth wedding anniversary this summer, which is awesome. I mean, they do truly love each other. But to me, if I modeled my future relationships after what they look like, it'd be a disaster. <laughs> yeah, because it, things have completely changed as far as what people expect and want from a, 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 another person versus what when they were children and adult, and young adults growing up, you know. Yeah, anal sex. No, like my uh, my parents. My it was more of that <laughs> nuclear family vibe where the mother stayed at home, the father went and was a provider. And, and leave it to beaver. Yeah. And it, it was great. Now, if I brought that mentality in today's world, I would be like hashtag me too out of every situation. I don't know. It'd be, it's, it's tough. Well, it's interesting. It's I actually had a world. conversation about this yesterday with our friend Carlo, who was on the uh, podcast and this woman who we met who had just arrived on island. We were having lunch and she just arrived. And so we invited her to have lunch with us. And we ended up having um, she was from Nashville, Tennessee. And we were having a conversation actually about this very thing, about why the divorce rate is so high and contributing part of it, because it's certainly not all of it, but just a, we were talking about this one part of how, um, you know, with the rise of modern feminism, this idea that women, um, women don't want to go into to like this idea of what traditional roles are, you know, like the man, when you think back to like hundreds of years ago, the man was like the hunter and the provider and the woman was the nurturer. And, you know, in in that sense, taking care of the home. And in reality, because we've been so conditioned through um, modern feminism to think that those roles are bad, we think that's only our role. But there is a this ideal of, well, there's a part of the man that's actually really good at that. It doesn't mean the woman can't do it. and But there are places where we actually are in our stronger, um, where, where we have more strength and where we're naturally more, uh, have inherent abilities to do. And we now live in a society that's telling us to kind of flip it so that the man is becoming more like the woman and the woman is becoming more like the man and it's confusing everyone. And when you think about it, it's like, well, there's this competition of you. I need to be able to take care of myself, which is great. I think everyone should have a level of independence, but it goes a bit too far in thinking that, well, I don't need you ever. Whereas we, we come to this uh, understanding of there are certain things that, men generally are are really good at and there are things that women generally are really good at. Uh, I'm not saying that women are generally really good cooks and men are really good like um uh you know hunters completely because I've met 
women who have can't even boil a pot of water. And I've met men who f- cook fantastic meals. But I am saying that there's this ideal that that we've been conditioned to completely forget that we actually have these natural roles that are part of who we are just in through our gender that isn't a bad thing, but we've been conditioned to think it's a bad thing and we have to kind of let it go and and completely disregard it. Does that make any sense? It's just when it goes, it makes, it does make sense, but I think it can, it goes to the extremes when you, like the leave it to beaver type relationship, which I was in for, well, I, not exactly. Cause it's not like I was a stay home mom by any stretch of the imagination. But, um, when you feel like you're tr- forced into that particular yeah. role, like mm-hmm. within the relationship, like that's an expectation of the relationship. Like I'm going to be the financial provider and you're going to, be the one who takes is the primary caregiver for the children. And that's alive and well in a lot of conservative Christian relationships. But if that's something that works for your relationship, like Michael's, yeah, that might work, you know, Mm -hmm. 50 years. And if that works for them, then that's wonderful. Like there's nothing Mm -hmm. wrong with it. I think that every relationship can be completely different. Like Brian and I have a completely different relationship than the ones that we had prior and know? our relationship would be completely different if we were raising small children and there was a, you know, a different type of family dynamic. I mean, it's, it's the relationship is contextual. Yeah. I think like, you know, when I think about me growing up and me looking at my parents, the one thing I didn't like where I found that my mom was weak and my dad was strong was that he was the breadwinner And so therefore he called the shots and I didn't like that. And I don't think that's healthy at all. I think that, um, you know, if, if you're in a relationship and you're in a relationship where the man has decided to have the job, the woman's going to stay home, take care of the kids and run the household. What I think was imprinted in my mind as it being bad was I saw my mom had no say. You know, like money is. Yeah. And money was used as a uh, leverage tool to either shut my mom down or make her feel less than, you know, that's what I saw as a kid. And I, and I hated that. Obviously, I don't think that's, that's also what we're taught in, you know, I mean, that's how we're programmed. Yeah. And and that's the, that's the unhealthy to me. That's the unhealthy um, version of this kind of, you know, the man brings home the bacon and the woman takes care of the house and the kids. But there is, but when, what I'm trying to say though, is, It's not all bad if you can take some of that out, you know, where there's equal um, say amongst how the the household and the family is run. Um, The woman doesn't need to ask for money, that there's already a settlement um, in place between the man and the woman so that the woman never feels like she's needing permission to do things. But I think when you take away that kind of power struggle and you have equal power within the couple... Then I don't think it. Then I think you it, the the game changes a little bit, and there's a, there's more respect. The roles don't matter. The roles don't matter. Well, see, yeah, I, I, and I agree with. Well, I agree with you, Nicole, because I think you you have a different upbringing than me. Even though I believe our our parents were both Catholic, or both of or both of our parents are Catholic, but like my parents. My dad had to go to my my dad worked, but my dad always went to my mom for money because my mom was the mm-hmm. controller mm-hmm. of her strings if you will so hmm. so and it wasn't like wasn't like my mom was like going no you got to go mow the lawn first before i give you some money it was never like that <laughs> but but they had like a, but she had a budget yeah, she yeah, was keeping exactly. the family to a budget exactly and they had a good understanding and they worked well as a team where i feel like in your situation nicole unfortunately the power yeah struggle was too much one-sided yeah like you got they had an agreement that was upheld between the both of them that goes back then, and then today, I, I feel like today's problems. I couldn't imagine being a boy growing up today, in today's world. Like a teenage boy uh, uh, in this kind of world, I, I have no idea what they're thinking or what they feel like their purpose is in this world. No, oh, I agree. Uh, well, I agree. I feel just the fact that you 
you get to choose your gender now is really confusing. Which is terrible. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I feel can't like we're imagine. I feel like we're swinging so far in one certain direction. When is it going to stop? I mean, I just read an article about how a um um a baby died because a man came into the hospital with some stomach pains. And oh yeah, I know. I know. It yeah, out. I know where you're what going. What's going this? on? What were these stomach pains? Well, it wasn't a man; it was a woman that was wanting to be a man, or said to be a man, and they didn't test for pregnancy. And so, yeah, this uh, man was pregnant, or woman, or whatever. And uh, unfortunately, the, the, it was a stillborn pregnancy. But like at the end of the day, this is ludicrous. To not to go into the hospital and say no no I'm recognized as a man so only look at me as a man, and then you got all these like um, these things going on around the country where you know this girl breaks the new record for the hundred meter dash or whatever and like that wasn't a girl no you can't say that or else you'll you know face the consequences of society. It just when is it going to stop? When's it going to go? If it if it ever is going to go back, it will it go back, or will it swing so hard the other way? Because you know how the pendulum works, that will be in a in a completely different state in fifty years. It's going to be in. Yeah, I think I think it's a it's on an arc, and it'll it'll have to normalize. It's like we're testing the the boundaries, and a lot of the boundaries are absurd, and it it it'll it'll have to come back to some sort of some sort of normal yeah I, we're just we're just all afraid of you know getting sued because we live in a litigious society i, I would say more than getting sued brian i would say more being arrested. shamed being shamed like like literally i almost lost my job because of social media a, a year and a half ago and and if you say one wrong thing that's recorded that you sometimes don't you know being is being recorded and put on to the internet airwaves of whatever they call them it's out there and you could lose a lot you could lose your job you could lose you know a lot of things in your life and it's just when's it going to stop is that would be my biggest fear is just being shamed out of society or out of your profession and you know yeah because someone didn't like what you said well there's a lot of say that again nicole i'm sorry because someone didn't like what you said yeah Basically, and there's a lot of people that don't like what I say. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't need any recording Most. devices near me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm literally on this podcast. Except being, being on a podcast right now. <laughs> yeah. Irony. Have so best. Be careful what you say. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of the pendulum swinging going on. Yeah. In many, many areas right now. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's all part of the process of finding the balance. And, you know, you got to go to these extremes in order to realize, wow, that extreme's not healthy for a lot of us. Absurd. And, uh, but we would have never known it had we never gotten there. And I feel like that's where we're at right now, especially with um, the, uh, the, the transgender uh, issue and sports, you know, competing with women and having trans women compete with um, biological women. And, um, that is definitely something that I think is starting to raise a lot of concern amongst, I would hope women who fought for equal rights. Well, that's a, that's a thing. You're right, Nicole. I mean, like the, you say, fem I'm actually consider myself a feminist in many ways, but not the third wave feminism. The third wave feminism is destructive. Yeah. It's just destructive to society in my opinion. Um, but, but you're right. It's just like. You want to make sure this that if you had children, if we had children, how, how do you know how to raise them? Would not know. I'd feel like just lock them up in a cave, keep them away from this world. Homeschool them. Homeschool no them parents better. know how to raise. I, I, no new parent knows how to raise a child. I, I know, Brian, right. I, 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 and I hear that, but like I'm extra fearful. Maybe this last few years, maybe I'm just being paranoid. You, you are. You are literally the norm. No different <laughs> than any other. Set of potential parents. Well, it is I, I, you have you have no idea. You think you're gonna break the kid. You're gonna be a terrible influence. It's not me. I don't think I'm and, gonna. I, I think I'll do just 
damn fine raising a kid. It's society that I think will break think, the kid. And, 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 and those are all things that go through in, in a, a, a potential new parent's head, and, and, it, and it works out. Yeah. It, and, I, and I would assume this has been the case for a long, 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 long time. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to raise a kid, and then you raise no, a kid. No, I think Brian, you're I mean, missing. You're missing the. I think you're missing the point I was just here. Say you're missing he's not my just point. talking about being a parent. Yeah, he's talking about the social structures that are being um, forced upon people right now, especially children at a young age that you don't necessarily have control over when you put them in school. If that's what you choose to do, that they're now being subjected to this idea that you can choose your gender, and we never had that growing up. You know, so now on top of like that, you you have these kids who are saying, oh, I, you know, I'm, you know, they're a girl, say they're born a girl and they're like, oh, now I believe I'm a boy. I want to be a boy. And you have parents giving them hormones and injecting them before they're even like 10 and, you know, doing all of this harmful damage that can never be reversed. The- but every, every generation has had something. There was there were parents that didn't have electricity and then their kid, their children had electricity and how's that going to change thing? And then horses and cars and radio and then television. Okay. But that you're you're, you're, very evil evolutionary type thing. Yeah. This this is like, you know, harming the body. This is abuse. (laughs) This is like, you can't ever, you're not to me. This is abuse. No one should be, you are the parent you know what's better for your child and the child does. That's why you are the parent until they're 18 and they can make adult decisions for themselves. That there is no way that a child should be going through hormonal changes because they decide to tell you that they're a boy when they're really a girl. How many times did I'm like, because oh, they I'm, learned I'm a- it in school. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Where, you well, know, like, oh, I'm a unicorn today, mom. Well, I, is it I, when I, my I, mom going to try and give me horse medication to well, like turn me into like- some unicorn? Nicole, look at me and you. Like, for example, I was, um, uh, as a kid, I played with the girls on recess. I played house, like, with the girls on recess. All the boys played basketball and stuff like that. I know it doesn't surprise you. I'm quiet with that. Anyway, so (laughs) can you imagine, though, like, if if my vulnerable little boy brain, everybody's like going, oh, you like to play with girls? You like to play house? Oh, you it's okay you want to put a dress on i could just see it happening right now and then like you you said you were quite a tomboy when you were young Mm -hmm. and and so it's like these are just our personalities it's not because we're leaning to one sex versus the other at least i don't think pretty sure i'm still a guy i don't i don't think so but i think you're exactly right there are little boys who like to play with Barbie dolls or mm-hmm. girls' toys or and girls want to play with trucks, like girl type. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So but when it doesn't when mean they need to change their gender, but it's- when when we exist in our in our light body, because you guys, you and I'm looking at my wife and I'm talking to you, Nicole, believe in this wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly that we're evolving, we're ascending into a light being. Is there a gender? And how is how does this? gender confusion discussion that we're talking about how does this not just work perfectly into there is no gender so you can't have it both ways you can't be like oh my god this is the end of this is the end of times that it's not fair for our kids to 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 be confused about gender i don't necessarily believe evolving into a, a a genderless time no but okay well i've talked about this a lot in my videos i don't believe in homogenizing the genders Okay, I believe that in in nature, in creation, you have masculine energies and you have feminine energies. Okay, you don't homogenize them and neutralize them into one. They work synergistically with one another for the ultimate creation. And that's actually creation in its highest power when you're recognizing both and allowing both to work synergistically with one another, not trying to neuter the energies and make them one. But gender is a 3D thing. Gender is a physical aspect. It's a, bo- it's a body. It's a body part. But it's a we physical are in thing. 3D. But we are in 3D. We are living a, an earthly experience. But all you guys do, every time I say something about 3D, you guys are like, oh, no, we're, we're like, oh, we're evolving. And I want to be in 4D. And, oh, I can't wait to be in 5D. And, no, oh, I never say when, that. When do no, I, get to I be never in say that. No. Do not, do not t- say that I say that because I never say that. And neither is Lisa. That's you uh, uh, they're hearing you're, that you're, and making, you're, yeah. You're hearing something that we're not saying. Yeah. We we do talk about ascension and we do talk about 
moving into 5D, and that's true, but we're still having an earthly experience in this body. And until we leave this body, we will be a gender and we will have to deal with the the slowing down of everything and and time, basically. But also we're living in time. Five D is not a place. You know, it's not like you leave three D and you go to five D. It's just a frequency. It's a dimension. So you can still be in your body and experiencing fifth dimensional frequency. Which we are because we so we have you're, moved. Yeah, in which you're so when you're ascending, it's not like you're leaving the earth and 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 dissolving into some energy force. That's not what ascension is. Although that's what a lot of people, when they first start learning about it, think it is. But I'm pretty sure we've talked about this on the podcast. Um, that it's not about going somewhere. I don't think we really have yeah. talked. Well, about you it. know, I was thinking about that today. Is like when before this podcast, I was like, I just don't know what the end result of what you guys really want the ascending. What? What is there like a magical chocolate pie waiting for us in ascension <laughs> heaven? Like, what is the what is the? Point? I hope so. <laughs> no, she wants chocolate chip cookies. Yeah. <laughs> But like it's, I never hear anything, any solid, real reason to ascend besides you'll know more. You know, knowing more. I think it's just about the integration of it's the integration of mind, body, and spirit. It's the integration. It's learning to integrate those aspects of you and become become whole your, like your understanding is, your, your is, ego and understanding your e- your inner child and understanding your higher this is self the, and, i guess the biggest challenge i run into with this whole thing is is your guys hypotheses is basically we live a lot of different lives that teaches us lessons that somehow brings us closer to quote unquote enlightenment or ascension or whatever and i'm like it, it, i just feel like it's a very bad way of doing things very unproductive It's understanding that you're the creator of this life, I think, that you are in control, I think, is the end end result, that everything that you experience is a reflection of, you know, it's your hologram, you created it, and taking responsibility for everything that is in your life and knowing that you can have it all. So you're you're in control of your, your decisions? Like you're like you, your decisions. Absolutely. You're, 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 but you're, you control your life. Like everything is perfect. Your every, everything that happens in your life was meant to be. It's your. Yes. Right. Yes. You chose it for whatever lessons to learn. Right. It's bringing awareness to things inside of you, shadow aspects of yourself. Okay. So with that on the tip of your tongue, talk about the gender stuff again. Because how can you guys, you're, you're looking at somebody else's paper when you're, when you're judging a parent for, for allowing their kid to go through something, you're looking at somebody else's paper. You're absolutely right. It's that child that chose, child to, chose come, to go through this. Exactly. You're, you're so exactly you guys right. can't have it both ways, but the pendulum Hold still on has a swung second. too far. Hold on a it's, second. The pendulum has swung way too far and these shouldn't be things that children are having to deal with just because a child has come in to chose to do that doesn't mean it's still right that child may have chosen to come into this life to experience that with the parents in order to teach us that it's not the right thing to do just because someone's chosen to experience it doesn't mean it's great just because someone came in to be to choose um sexual molestation or um you know being murdered doesn't mean that's right murder or rape exactly It's just an experience. You know, it's us as a society, as a collective working together. Yeah, it's an experience that is probably to wake us up. To wake us up like, hey, uh, things are going in in a too extreme direction and it's causing a lot of pain and we're not addressing that pain. And just for so, because sorry, this is a side question, but you guys ever get irritated about how many people are using the term waken or woke? Uh, I don't know. I, I know what you're talking about. Like in a bad way? No, in a very bad, well, in a bad way. I mean, like, oh yeah, this, uh, these people are so woke. You know, they don't, they don't care. You can be this gender, that gender, because they're so woke. You see that a lot. I've never heard that. Oh, wow. that's because we don't watch the news. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, are you saying that they okay. literally use it in mainstream news? You're right, Brian. 
Unfortunately, oh, I, I, I didn't, didn't I didn't realize that. I've, I've dabbled. Oh, like they're trying to spin, like saying, like, like, like these guys are enlightened. Liberals these, are yes, woke. Yes. And they're causing these problems. Yes. yes. There, terrible. there is a lot of that talk out there, uh, and that's and, and they and they and they say it with the in, with inappropriate grammar. Woke. They'll say the word, the term woke. Nice. These guys are woke. And well, they're using slang. They're, yeah. Yeah. It's like being swole. Swole. Right. Right. <laughs> What is that? You don't know what swole is? Oh, man. Uh, big, big. You're, you're obviously not oh. woke. <laughs> you're not woke because you don't know swole. <laughs> that is one thing that I've devolved in this past year. I have, I, I, ashamed to say it. I've started a little bit more watching the news and stuff just because it's just sadly so entertaining in, in a very not so healthy kind of way, but it is entertaining. Hmm. Yeah. Well, um, there's a, there's a, there's a show stopper right there, <laughs> but here's the thing, ba- Brian, back to the whole, like, um, the gender thing and, 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 and all of that, I do not believe, and this is me, this is my opinion. Okay. I do not believe that we should be mutilating our bodies uh, and causing so much trauma to our bodies in order to um, become Ooh. one sex or genderless. Um, right. I I think that that's just way too, the pendulum's gone way too far. People are, and I think that there's so much confusion happening and that's why this is happening is because people are really confused and we're not addressing the real issues where we're always constantly talking about the physical body, but what about the mental body and the emotional body. And we're not addressing that as a society with people who are feeling like they're one gender or not the other. And we're actually going to have a guest on about this topic. Uh, We've contacted him. He's going to, he's agreed to come on and I'm really excited to have this conversation because I think it's one that we need to be having, but just to kind of touch on it lightly and not go too far into it. You know, there are people who have transitioned and now are regretting it and realizing it was the worst mistake of their life. What do you do when you've already made that transition? You can't go back. You can't reassemble uh, appendages back onto the way that you you were. This is a huge, this is not a small trifle that people are. No, and we're. And and to your point, this is what a child doesn't understand. Exactly. A child does not understand the, the, grown-up implications the long-term physical absolutely implications of such a decision. but what's well, even you worse can't drink alcohol till you're 21 you shouldn't be able to mutilate your body until you're an adult well here's the thing is that we're not addressing and this is what i uh, listen if someone is in a great mental place and emotionally happy and this is still what they want to do and i believe and they're 18 i believe all the power to them then then that's what they choose to do that's their body it's their sure. it's their life but a lot of the times what's happening and what I, you know, I've been reading this book about it is the doctors aren't addressing the mental issues and the emotional issues and seeing that these, a lot of these people have either um, alcohol problems or had been sexually abused when they were children. There are a lot of deeper mm. underlying issues that we as a society are glazing over because we just want to be ex- accepting of someone's choice. And we're not actually seeing deeper into the pain. And I feel like we're doing a disservice to our society and the people who are actually in pain and helping them get through that. And then if they still want to make this choice, you know, to physically change their bodies when they, we know that they've, they're mentally in a good place and emotionally in a good place, they're happy, then that's a completely different story. But that's not what's happening right now. And I feel like we as a society need to start um, having – uh, more important conversations about this and helping one another out on the deeper levels because this is just about dealing with the surface issues, right? We're we're not going deep. We're not going deeper into, you know, the the pain. We're just saying, oh, you want to change your body? Okay, that sounds like a great idea. You know, like when people thinking, oh, I want to get the surgery because I know it's going to make me feel better. Well, maybe it will. <laughs> but for a lot of times, it doesn't fill the void that, you know, people have. And so there's still this unhappiness there. The easiest reminder for me of make sure that my childhood self doesn't control the rest of my life is just go back to my freshman year of high school pictures. <laughs> what the hell was I thinking? 
Who wears you like your hair? Do you have that on your phone so you can look, so you can look at it? Silk short sleeve shirts buttoned up all the way to the top. Nobody. That Nobody was a style, actually. I, I remember that. I remember who button down shirts their, all the way to the top. Who pegs their jean legs? Nobody who should control their own gender. That's it. <laughs> This is true. This is a very true statement. This is why, like, you know, parents, well, at least when I was growing up, you were not allowed to get a tattoo until you were of, like, an age to decide, like, you know, if that was really what you wanted on your body. And I'm so happy because I remember when I was 16, I wanted to get a tattoo of a Heinz ketchup bottle on my uh, body. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, if I was your dad. You're lucky I wasn't your dad. I'd be like, yes. I thank God that I didn't do that because that was a horrible choice. That would have been a horrible decision on (laughs) my end. Why? You got to tell us the story. Why? I loved ketchup as a kid. I used to eat a that bottle match. of ketchup wow. with a with an order of chicken fingers and fries. Wow. I, I would get high off the sugar. And uh, it was just – it was like I just loved it. I I craved ketchup. And so mm. I just thought it was my thing. You know, if anyone saw me eating fries, it was, oh, do you want some fries with your ketchup? It was never – like it just was my thing. And so I just thought, oh, it would be so cool if I got a ketchup bottle tattooed onto my body. <laughs> and I'm so glad I outgrew that one. I'm and this is the cool thing. You that one. <laughs> but you know, this is what this is totally normal. You have bad ideas when you're a kid because you don't know that I, you don't know yet consequences of actions. You don't understand long term effects yet because <laughs> you're you haven't lived that long yet. You know what I'm saying? So. These are th- and your brain isn't even formed. yeah your brain yeah. isn't even fully formed dead. until like what is it you're 24 or something frontal lobe I think it's 21 or 23 yeah so it's like why are we allowing these kids to conduct or you know giving them exactly what they ask for or believing like what they what they want is what they actually need you know that this is what's concerning right now I have to say this is part of my generation which I'm actually really um, disappointed in. That th- this is part of my generation that's been raising kids and doing this. Mm-hmm. And I think that we can do better. Which is why the pendulum has swung this way and now it's opening our eyes. Okay, that that definitely is not the way to do it. We got to figure out a better way. So, yeah. So, homeschool it is. <laughs> it is. That's what I'm doing. I, I mean, I have to say, I, I'd probably agree with you. I just, I can't imagine sending them through the, the system. No, we had, I actually had the conversation yesterday because again, I was with Carla and this woman, we we're having lunch and Carla was like, oh, homeschool is not a good idea. And I said, well, why not? He goes, because you're not integrating them into society. You know, that whole um, spiel and all that, which I understand. Well, it's, it's There's so many different ways you can though. Yeah. Them. And that's what I was trying to say. I homeschool my kids and... That was my number one reason for doing it: socialization. Yeah, yeah. better socialization. They, how, than what they would have uh, and, and and okay, so you're a good person to to give the true honest opinion. Now that it's been probably years since you've homeschooled, they they turned out just fine. I'm assuming they're doing well. They're, they're, they they know kids. how to communicate with other people. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> They only, I, they, and we, we've I've I've mentioned this many many times on the show. Just I because they were able to be who they were without constantly having to compare themselves to other people. I think it made them stronger individuals. Yeah. They know who they are. They're very grounded and they're very confident in who they are. And then they also were allowed to be friends with all sorts of different people, like. You know, it didn't like my 13 year old would play with a four year old or play with a 25 year old. It did. You know, there was just no rules. There were just people. And so they're very open minded and non judgmental. And they didn't get pulled and into they, the cliqueiness of school of like, oh, you're not cool. I'm not hanging out with you. And because, you know, you're you're just doing math and I want to be out with the football guys or I want to be with the uh, drama students or, you know, like it's those kind of things create like this kind of segregation that people are fearful of when you homeschool. And it's like, the exact opposite can happen. You just are accepting of everyone because you're not being programmed by these other groups that you're looking at. Like one is better than the other. Well, there are 
the fear or, or what people see is and back when I homeschooled, you know, my kids are 25 and 27. So when I, when I was doing it, it was not a popular thing. It had just started, but the people who were homeschooling at that time were doing it for religious reasons. And it was sort of cultish like, and the mm-hmm. homeschooling kids were only hanging out with other homeschooled kids. And there were a bunch of nerds with their, you know, taped up glasses and things like that. And I chose to homeschool in a completely different way. I didn't have my kids just part of homeschooling, <clears throat> you know, groups and things like that. You know, my kids were into Taekwondo and motocross and they were, you know, joined the YMCA basketball. You know, they were out with lots of different types of people and integrated in, in lots of different areas. So I think you can you can definitely do homeschooling wrong. Yeah. Oh, I, <laughs> just yeah. Like I just like with anything. I mean, <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, you know, it's not that home. And there are some, you know, I would keep my kids out of public school, but, you know, there are some great private schools that have really good philosophies on things and allow kids to be more individual and stuff. So, you know, there's not all schools are bad, but and you know, it's just there's there's still hope for our youth because <laughs> I showed Lisa and I I'm pretty sure Michael you know about her. The 14-year-old girl, Soph Mm-mm. on YouTube. She Mm-mm. has a YouTube channel. She's pretty I've never heard she's of her. pretty crazy awesome. Yeah, like she well crazy she's awesome. She's um well she's being dubbed by um media as uh, right, extreme right wing, um, whatever, uh, because she doesn't censor anything that comes out of her mouth, but she's probably one of the most intelligent, one of the most intelligent people who can speak at 14, never mind 50. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, she just, she's, no, S O P H. So, huh? no, I've never heard of her. Oh my gosh. She's just, she's so incredibly intelligent. Whether you believe in what she's talking about or not really isn't the point. When you listen to her, you just, you have to be blown away by her age and her ability to communicate and the knowledge that she has. And and it's, she talks about amazing. how the education system's broken and, you know, that it needs to be reformed. And uh, she does it in a very... I mean, uh, offensive it's, way. <laughs> good, good. I want. I want. I will. I will enjoy it then, because yeah. it is. It is completely broken. It is so. It's such a waste of time. I even felt that though. I remember the last time, last day I was in school, even in, in my university. I literally like looked at the previous 15, 16, 18 years of my life being in school, whatever it was at the time, as a, as such a waste of time. Not a waste of time of like, okay, uh, I didn't learn anything, but it was a waste of time. Like I could have been doing something a lot better my first yeah. 20 years of my life than this. That's what kept me homeschooling year after year is realizing how much time it took me to take, you know, for my kids to go through their lessons and do, you know, learn certain things. And then to think, well, you could go to school and we'd have to get up at 630 in the morning and then you wouldn't be home until, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon. And wow, you actually did all that you needed to do in three hours. Mm -hmm. And that's, and then we. I think another big waste of time was summer breaks. God, that wasted so much time. If you, if you took all the summer breaks out and then you took all the time of relearning everything the, that you forgot during the summer. I could, probably could have been done with college at like 15 years old, <laughs> 16 or something. So yeah. It was just such a waste. Well, you know, we are in the time we like the gender thing or whatever, where the pendulum has just really yeah. <laughs> swung the opposite direction in so many different areas. But by doing so, it's allowing us the opportunity to look at these things and say, you know, this isn't working. You know, and I think it has to go to the extreme where people wake up to it, you know, when it's just kind of in the middle and everybody feels sort of comfortable. But when it really starts going off the rails, that's when people start waking up to, okay, we need to do something better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think it's it's happening in so many areas. So it's not a bad thing. You know, it's actually a really beautiful thing when you think about it, as long as you're aware of it, you know, as long as you're aware, as long as you're woke. You, just, you have to be aware, you know, you can't walk through this life with just blinders on following 
what everyone yeah you, or think. or not not yeah you have to think being so, being scared to disagree because you might be you know shamed or something like that like you're you're entitled to have an opinion you're entitled to think differently than the way you know group think is going like mass group think you and i and i think that's where we're kind of also waking up to that is that wow, there are so many people who really want you to agree with them because it's the way everyone's thinking versus, oh, well, everyone should just be thinking for themselves. Because um, I just think we as a society would be so much further along and have so much more available to us if we actually were so open to people thinking differently and having these conversations. Yeah. Brian and I were just talking about this yesterday. We went um, for a hike up in the in Rocky Mountain National Park and there was a long line to get into the park and there were it was kind of like when you come out of the airport and you have to stop at one of the booths to pay there were like four different booths and we noticed there were two long lines but we could see four rooftop rooftops so we knew that there were four booths but there were these two lines and as we got a little closer the lane to the right opened so we got in it and and there was like nobody in this third lane. And the fourth lane was a, a pass lane. You could just drive past. And we were just laughing at like how we were looking behind us and there were so many cars in these two lanes and we were in this third lane and there was no one behind us. And there was probably, we could see there was room for, you know, at least eight or 10 cars to be behind us. And it just made us think about you know how they how in school they teach you to Con follow, you know, follow this is where you're supposed to go and conform and you have to do this and people are not taught to think for themselves yeah. you know just do what everybody else is doing <laughs> sorry brian just <laughs> photoshopped a heinz ketchup bottle <laughs> <laughs> on my a picture of me oh i forwarded it to to brian i meant to forward it to michael so um, to our audience, Brian has just. I was wondering why I was wondering why he was so quiet. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! Oh, I think well, you, well, I think you should. I will be it. using this as the, the thumb the thumbnail for. No, our don't episode. use it as the thumbnail. You can yes. put it in the episode, but please do not use it as the thumbnail. <laughs> it's so I was thinking more of uh, inner thigh, though, Brian. Next time, okay. <laughs> So well, bad. if we can get a picture, I don't have that picture. <laughs> I think I do. I have one from no. the beach. No, no, <laughs> do not. I am, I am sure you do not do that. So I, I didn't. A... I didn't get a choice when I was called an asshole in the title. <laughs> oh God, you're still butthurt over that. So um, I have a question. I have a question for Brian actually, because it's been a, a little bit more than a year since I've been off. Has there been any? Um, memorable guests that really got you thinking wow what what's what's this all about since you guys have oh sure we've we've had we've like, had a number of guests any that, that just stands been... out in your mind like wow this one mike you gotta go well, back i think i think one out. of i think one of our best guests was one of probably one of your was close to the end jessica allstrom i think is is has has been one of one of the best guests that that we've had on and uh eric rains i really Really enjoyed him. He is an in incredibly gifted uh, tarot reader. No, he does. Um, that's, that was, really, that's Matthew. Matthew, yeah. I'm sorry, Matthew Mor Mornian. Um, really, really uh, incredibly gifted. Eric, wicked smart. Eric Rains. Eric Rains is just just incredibly smart. I mean, we, yeah, we we've, really? we've actually had some some guests that you know they what they know they know so well so deeply and broadly that they're just great conversations and nothing nothing for me to call them out on because they they really know what they're talking about you know on the flip side of that is is you know some guests that you know it just it doesn't it doesn't make sense you know that that it it doesn't seem like everything that they say is well thought out or that they really it's not they like not free. They, they can't they can't explain every everything. Yeah, I mean, and and, and I, I think my favorite guests are those that are so well educated, and you know, those they they really know they really know. They it. speak to and your science mind. Yeah, mm -hmm. they can answer. They can answer. You can ask any question, and they can answer it 
um, or they they're able to describe it in such a way that it doesn't leave room for for questioning because it just it just makes sense. I'm able to listen and get it and understand it. I always think to the- Brian went to the uh, Quantum Revolution tour. I don't know if you know that, but uh, Jessica Alstrom was a guest on our show and she has been, and she was telling us about this quantum revolution tour that she was putting on. And so Brian said, well, I think we should go is the enlightened up podcast. So Nicole and Brian and I, and another friend drove out to Vegas and actually went and did the three day conference with her. And, and we did a podcast on it and, and Brian got a lot out of it. Yeah. Half of it was really good. Half, That's good. Well, it, you know, it was, it was like a, two and a half day, three day, three day thing. And the first, definitely the first half of that conference really spoke to me and who I was. And, and, and I think it for, for, for you as well, I think anyone, I think it would, the, the first half of that, that conference had nothing to do with spirituality or gro- It was about personal growth <clears throat> and, and anyone not, you don't have to be going through a personal journey. And I said this, I said this right when we came back and we did the summary, uh, you know, of, of, of that, of that event. Um, there's another one coming in September. And if it's, if it's like the one that we went to in July, March, you, it, you, the one that we went to in March, I, I think you would get a lot out of it. I, th- I think that would be a, a great thing because it was, it was that impactful. Now, the second half of it got got a little bit more woo woo and and didn't didn't speak to me who I was. Uh, so I went and sat by the pool. And Lisa and Nicole, I spoke to you guys. I'm assuming. Well, no, it I actually it didn't. Or did all three? It, of you interestingly, the pool? <laughs> no. Interestingly enough, Nicole and I went and sat by the pool. Oh. The last. Well, the, okay. The, well, the last I want to be fair though. Um, a lot of the stuff that she talked about, I already gone through in my own journey. And so I had already gone through a lot of the stuff and it was just kind of like refresher. I love listening to Jessica talk. I just could listen to her talks like all day long. She's fantastic. And she just always brings it around to everyday stuff that makes it really easy to understand what she's trying to relay. Um, But a lot of the uh, other stuff wasn't, it was all stuff I'd already done before. And so I was happy to be there and go through the experience. Uh, but I was also going through my own personal experience at that time that was outside of that tour. So I had a lot of stuff that I was wanting to assimilate on my own and needing some of my own time. Uh, and as well, because the 2018 was such a crazy year and and so was the beginning of 2019 with the cruise, I really wanted to take a bit of time out for myself to just relax. And I needed, if I had gone there and gone completely through the whole conference and didn't take at least a couple hours to sit by the pool and just lie in the sun, which is what I really needed, then I would have been really upset with myself. And one of the things they told us at the tour was like, this is for you. Don't do things because you think other people expect you to do them or anything. Just listen to yourself and do what is right for you. So I did that. Yeah. But it was a great, it was a great um, conference. Very, very well done and very well put together. I still hold on to my rock. You still, you still got your money oh. rock. I still got my money rock. It's doing well. Nice. <laughs> That's the one thing. Like I, I'm like, I, I, and I tell people like this. I, I was um, at the at a valet place the other day, and I had to pull out um, my wall or my pocket some a couple of dollars to give for a tip, and my rock came out of my pocket, and the and the valet guy stopped or and, and stooped over and picked it up. And he goes, "What's this? This is your lucky charm, isn't it?" I'm like, "You bet it is." He goes, "We were meant to find this." I'm like, "We talking about we? <laughs> Give it to me." <laughs> I'm like, "No, no, no. I mean, like, you were meant to talk to me about this today." I'm like, "What? What are you talking Synchronicity. about?" Synchronicity. Yeah, he started going, "Oh, yeah, no, like this does well for you," and and started telling me like the type of crystal that it does, and this and this and this, and like. Okay, yeah, you're making sense. Not giving my rock. What kind of crystal is it? <laughs> um, just your I, I, clear just quartz. Your, your clear quartz, yeah. Clear quartz. And I mean, it's the one the one rock that I got from a random. It was so random too. I mean, it's a rock to me, but it's so random too because that was the one where I went to the the psychic, kind of like, oh, you gotta check out this psychic. She's entertaining. 
So I did that, and but the psychic goes, "Man, you got some problems. Here's a rock." <laughs> <laughs> I summed it up kind of. That's kind of how it was like. It was like because it was it was um, a very vulnerable, darker part of my life when I got it. But like ever since then, it's done well. So I still to this day, even though I don't really believe in a lot of this stuff, I still throw it on the windowsill, let it charge back up with the sun, get it going again. <laughs> Hmm. So, Put I it on the dropped, moon. Really... so i haven't dropped everything <laughs> it's like anything though it's just your belief yeah i've done it with the moon too yeah whether it's a rock i don't know or... I, I look at it as like a psychological something but whatever i'm entertained though hey. on, on what you guys find uh out there when it comes to your people like you said something about a tarot card reader that was really impressive brian mm -hmm. what, was, what yeah. was impressive with that that sounds inter interesting to me but it was believable so you know it i i don't i don't know what what else to say beyond that because you know tarot's i don't want to say it's, it was always tar gimmick, tarot is always that gimmicky part of of that side of i don't know it I, is very yeah. very gimmicky but you, you know i'm Maybe he's just so he, he knows the cards so well. You know, some people, I you know, I think they they don't, and and that that's the big difference. He knows so much about the meaning of each card on so many different levels that it's effortless for him. And it was quite he would look it was at quite it quite accurate and, for you, I'm assuming. Yeah, well, yeah, and then he there was, was also able to, he was able to, he was picking up on intuitive stuff as well, right? So that, exactly, see, that's yeah. what I was thinking. Is like how tarot cards do it. Is they don't really care about what the cards is. They they're intuitive with the person in front of them, and then they figure out a way to explain whatever card is flopped in front of them on how it's going to tie into the person next to them. That's well, why the, car, the cards are like a the cards are like a tool. So they provide some information that may also go in line with what you're intuitively picking up, and all of a sudden a story comes together and. You might be right. It might be wrong. It, you know, that's kind of how I see it. And and Nicole has become quite good at her intuitive craft. and her craft with cards. Interesting. Yeah, Nicole is very, very good All with right. her cards. We'll have to, we'll have to dabble you with that a, the next time. You should I'm, get a tarot yeah. reading from her. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Michael, we'll do a tarot reading. I'm sure it'll be nothing but great good news. <laughs> <laughs> Although I am looking forward to it, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys all like somehow in the in in the, in the three D physicality one of these days. Yeah, we're glad you came back on the show. Yeah, it was fun, um, but we're probably reaching our time limit, aren't we? Yes. <laughs> yes. Get off the phone. <laughs> well, it was good to have you back and uh, reunite. Put in a little bit of. Uh, I know our listeners enjoyed you and you were on the podcast and they've written in and, and, and times, said right so. Right. And so I'm sure, <laughs> sure you have a couple fans out there who will be excited to hear your voice on today's episode. So thanks so much for joining us. And Hey, 200 two years, episodes. two years to That's lighten up. pretty darn impressive. Not 200 episodes, Not two 200. years. Oh, two years. I thought you said 200. I'm like, two years. and you guys must have been working night and day. That's still like, well, no, hundred, no. yeah. <laughs> hundred and some odd episodes. So I'd imagine. So that's pretty good. Yeah. 105, yes. 105. Nice. Yeah, so thanks so much, Michael, and no, um, a pleasure. We're, we'll have you back on again, I'm sure, at some point, and we'll have to arrange a uh, another trip to the mountains. Yeah, so I want my cards read accurately this time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we'll, and we'll look for UFOs <laughs> under the stars. Oh, please. Oh, that's another thing. A whole new show, different show. That I really want to get into. And we were just starting. All right. We were just starting to dabble with it. Like I remember, there's one guest that that we had. Shortly the city ranch. Left. Oh, it was such a fascinating thing. Even if it was all made up stuff, I just am fascinated by that stuff. We still want to go there. We haven't. The, uh, the UFO place in the state of Washington. I got to go there. For yeah. Guys. I'll let you know. Yeah. I'll, I'll keep an open mind and see if I see Bigfoot on a UFO. That sounds good. Yeah. All, all right. right. Okay. And to our listeners, thanks so much for joining us again. We will be back with you all next week. Thank you all for joining our show. We appreciate you tuning in and supporting us. If any of you have any questions you would like answered on the show or any guests that you would like to hear on our show, please email that information to us at info at enlightenup.us or send us a voice message using the Anchor app. There's a super cool feature on there that allows you to send us a message or ask us a question with a touch of a button right from the app. 
And please continue to support us by following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And if you haven't checked out Nicole's channel on YouTube yet, head on over there for some more insight from her, or you can visit her website, inflexibleme.com, where you can book a personal coaching session or a tarot reading, watch some of her most informative videos, or you can sign up for her newsletter. And if you're interested in some light language healing, head to my YouTube channel, Lisa Loves Love, or send me an email to lisa at lisaloveslove.com to inquire about your own personal reading. Thank you again for joining us and supporting us, and we'll be back with you all next week.